Please, it is Vanya, your mic is open. Um, I think we are online, okay? Now we are. Okay, great. So Paula, I will I will keep it with you, okay? Okay, may I start now? I think we can. Okay, so um Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening for whoever is at uh, is somewhere else. Um, I am Paula Camargo. I'm PhD candidate at SDWERG, and I will be the host in this afternoon event, Correspondencias, Um Encontro com Tim Ingold, or in English, Correspondences, An Encounter with Tim Ingold. First of all, um, I would like to thank Professor Ingold, or Tim, as he said he prefers to be called, for joining us today for this conversation. I um, also thank my fellow researchers at LADA, the Design and Anthrop Anthropology Lab at the Superior School of Design in Rio de Janeiro State University, SGUERJ, at NIDA, the Nucleus of Research in Innovation, Design and Anthropology at the Federal University of Maranhão, UFMA, the Group of Inde Independent Studies, Umusidades, Humusities, and Professor Zoe Anastasakis, who is one of the coordinators of LADA and the creator of Umusidades, and Raquel Nor Noronha, coordinator of NIDA. Both of them have been corresponding with Tim Ingold for some time now and are responsible for making this conversation possible. Timothy Ingold is a British anthropologist and emeritus professor of social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen. From 2013 to 2018, he coordinated the project Knowing from the Inside, Anthropology, Art, Architecture and Design, which brought together a series of researchers around correspondence experimentations between those four subjects. Throughout his career, he published several bo books and the, that are fundamental to the reconsideration of anthropology as an engaged, open, and imaginative art of inquiry. In 2020, he published his most recent book, Correspondences. The event is programmed to last about two hours. We will begin with a brief introduction by Professor Zoe Anastasakis, followed by questions previously prepared for Professor Ingold by LADAS and NIDAS researchers. Each question will and answer should take about 10 minutes, completing the first hour and a half of our estimated time. Then we will have the remaining 30 minutes for Professor Ingo to answer questions selected from the chats on Zoom and YouTube. Please turn off your microphones and we wish everyone a great afternoon or evening, depending on where you are now. Thank you, Professor Zoya Anastasakis, please. Good afternoon, everyone. It is with great joy that we met Tim Ingold for a conversation that brings together students and researchers from LADA, NIDA, and the participants of the Independent Study Program in Immunities. Almost a decade ago, I had a remarkable encounter with your work, Tim. I was completing the writing of my doctoral thesis when I came across the Portuguese version of your paper, Bringing Things Back to Life, creative entanglements in a world of materials, which I read crying from beginning to end. Since then, in your work, I find ways to think with matters that are vital to my own research that spreads between anthropology and design. We met personally, personally in Rio in 2013, and since then we have been corresponding in various ways. And I am immensely grateful for the chance to join you and all the wonderful people I have met in Aberdeen in the most recent years when I had the opportunity to exchange with you and spend some time among the KFI team. 
During these visits, Raquel Noronha and I shared precious moments of learning. At both LADA and NIDA, we carry out research that goes on between design and anthropology, sometimes also approaching architecture and art. That's one of the reasons why your work has reverberated intensely on us. Together with our students and fellow researchers, we have read your books following the threads launched for you. That is why today I am very grateful for this opportunity to expand the conversations with you to our students. Thank you again for everything, Tim. Thank you, Zoe. Now we will start the questions of the researchers. There are nine questions and, which, and each will take around 10 minutes, starting with the researchers from LADA, Ilona Paterman, Brazil, PhD student in design, ESG will start. And I'm no, now much more beautiful since I have a necklace from... <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hi team, my name is Ilana and it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to meet you. So Tim, um, in your book, Making, you wrote, in some European languages, the word for design is the same as that for drawing. Their original synonym, however, rested on the idea of the drawing as the outline of a mental image. But what if we were to think of drawing in another way, not as a projection of an already made image, but as the inscriptive trace of a movement or gesture comparable to weaving with threads or carving in a stone. And also in your book, Being Alive, you wrote, the practice of drawing has little or nothing to do with the projection of images and everything to do with wayfaring. My research is about the making of drawings, of animations, of dances and gestures of Afro-Brazilian religious activities. Curiously, I literally project each frame of a recorded video over paper in an ongoing process of creating with free spirit, liquid watercolor and generously expansive charcoal. Drawing then seems rather a dance, step by step, recipically repeated improvised in gestures of a body that dances with materials and still with the body that appears dancing frame by frame in a blurred projection on the table. The use of handicraft techniques inspired by Afro-Brazilian animistic activities allows me to learn from making and from corresponding with active materials. I've sent you an image of uh, a few steps of the process and here actually I have some of the drawings just to illustrate. Um, so it's a woman dancing and then some of the frames uh, of the of the dance made with charcoal and liquid watercolor and charcoal is already all over myself <laughs> right now. Um, so in Portuguese design was translated as industrial drawing the word drawing, desenho, is often associated with primary school in comparison to design, which besides being in English, uh, suggests a more intellectual activity. However, drawing seems to propose a more balanced practice between the head and the rest of the body. Considering the holomorphic model as the idea of an imposition of mind over matter, would you relate it to coloniality? Moreover, could Drawing as an alternative meaning for design, playing with the translation, be an escape from it, inspired by animistic cultures that dialogue with materials and create with the whole body. Well, th thank you very much indeed, uh, Ilana, and I shall I, sh I, I I shall respond very very briefly. Um, yes, I think that there is a connection between the logic of hylomorphism and colonialism. However, hylomorphism is much older than colonialism, or at least the European colonial project. The hylomorphism goes back to Aristotle. But the thing about Aristotle's view of hylomorphism was that it was actually a very balanced one. He, he did uh, separate out form and matter, and he did say that when an artifact is made, it's by putting form and matter together. But he didn't say that all the activity is on the side of the, 
uh, form and that matter is entirely passive. He had a much more um, balanced account. And I think what is, what is interesting is that along with uh, modernity, along with the colonial project say, from the 16th or 16th century onwards, that's when the, the hylomorphic model began to become so unbalanced that the form was all where was all, where all the power and the activity was, and the ma material was just passive and submissive and and conquered. So 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 the hylomorphic model itself isn't isn't intrinsically unbalanced in that way, but through its but when it was co-opted by the um, so uh, by the colonial project, then um, it, it became unbalanced. Uh, and again, I agree with you. I think that there is something particularly animistic about drawing. It's a very lively activity. It's a, it's a, um, it's an activity of becoming a movement. But um, there's one thing that I would add, and that is that it's not all about the body. Um, in, in animistic cultures, the, uh, the stress is often put on the breath. So actually, you, you wouldn't make really a strong distinction between the mind and the body at all. That, that, that again, is a, a relatively uh, modern one. Uh, and, and for that reason, I, I do have some concerns about the excessive application in much writing today of the notion of embodiment, because embodiment means somehow that the body is taking things in, that the body, that things get settled and sedimented in the body. And that maybe works for breathing in. You know, when you breathe in, then, then what you breathe is ingested into the body and taken up. But what happens if you breathe out? And it, it seems odd to think of breathing out where you're giving out to your surroundings rather than taking in. It seems odd to think of that as a process of embodiment. And I, 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 th I think that it would be a good idea to uh, connect drawing much more closely to breath and to breathing and, and also to speech, because, you know, we, we speak on, on our breath, on, on the out breath, and, and, and we take the world in again on, on the in breath. And I, I think um, that, that if we want to move beyond the, the, the rather static logic of hylomorphism and come up with a, with a more uh, lively, more vital account, then I would suggest that we link drawing to the activity, first of all, to the activity of breathing, which is after all um, essential for, for life. Um, I've always been puzzled by the way breathing has been somehow forgotten uh, in, in, in the obsession with writing about, about the body. So I think that's as far as I can answer your questions uh, the, in, in, in the time available. And, and thank you so much. Maybe we should go on to, to the next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, or Tim. <laughs> and thank you, Ilana. Now we will proceed to the second question, um, which is from... Um, just one moment, um, from Marina Cerito, PhD student at LADA SD. Hi everyone, are you listening to me? It's okay? Thanks a lot, Tim, for being here with us. We are really happy. As Paula said, I'm a PhD student at LADA. My name is Marina, and my questions are part of my research interest. I am investigating the life of things in popular manifestation of culture. And I have came across many things that relate with each other, vinculating us to other worlds. Here I have a mask of Folia de Reis. And Folia de Reis is is a heavy 
that refers to the journey of the wise man when looking for Jesus. This mask is made with Quachi skin and is dressed by the clown, the only member of the heavenry who has a mask and who has the function to scare away the evil with, by, by the dance he does. The mask sets the clowns apart of all the other participants and turns him into another thing than the man wearing it. In the chapter Materials Against Maturity, in the book Being Alive, you suggest the materials are active components in a world information, which is starsly in movement, flowing, mixing, and transforming. I understand the mask and its materials in this sense. But what intrigues me here is the fact that these artifacts are considered magical or rituals, spirituals, by those who make them. In your view, are there magical artifacts that are distinguished from other things that participate in the world? And if I can do another question about the artifact, the, of this kind of artifact, I can ask you that these artifacts are largely handcrafted. And you present in the book, Making it, um, and in Being Alive, that we have a lot of to learn, a lot, a lot to learn with, uh, from materials and materiality as knowledge that are born from sensory perception. What could we designers reveal in our theories and practice in order to learn from materials and from those who works with material based on traditional and craft processes? Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. And that, that was fascinating and, and, and actually raised a, a, a new question for me, which I hadn't thought about. So, um, and that is, what is the relationship between the materials and the mask? And this way, I, I thought about masks and I thought about materials, but I haven't really put the two together and I'm not quite sure how, how best to do that. Thinking about masks, I've been really interested, and this is recently, not, not stuff that I published a long time ago, I've been thinking about the relationship between the mask and the face, and, and, and about the face itself, which is tremendously interesting. And the, the thing about a face is that it doesn't have a back. It, it, you, you, there's no back of your face. There's only the, the front bit that other people can see. But the mask has a front and a back. It has two sides to it. So the question is whether um, the mask is something that covers up so that, when the, so that the real wearer is there behind the mask. So the mask then is a disguise that covers them up. Or whether actually the mask is supposed to be a face itself, which doesn't have a back, so that the wearer actually becomes the very person who's wearing it. So the question is whether the, the mask is a disguise that covers up or whether the mask is a face that reveals a being. And, and what's so interesting is that, is that these two meanings of, of, of the surface, um, you, you often find them together. In, in English, um, and I'm not sure whether this works in, in Portuguese, in English we have the verb to wear. So you wear clothes, but you can also wear an expression on your face. And wear refers not just to covering up, it also refers to wearing out, to erosion. So, so even this verb has this double meaning of both covering up, but at the same time revealing. And that I think is what's so interesting about the mask, that it carries these two senses. And it might be, that part of the answer to the question as to what makes an object like that special or magical is because of this double nature of, of both covering and revealing. Or well, that was anyway um, the thought that I that I had, but but I hadn't really thought about how to relate that to the notion of of materials. I I, th I think. 
um, that we shouldn't think of the mask as an object. Um, because I don't know, but I would imagine that that um, even when it's not in use, uh, may, maybe if you put it in a museum, it might be an object. But for the people themselves, even when it's not in use, it's a very powerful thing that has to be uh, treated carefully because because you never quite know whether it's covering something up or whether there's actually a being there, whether it's somebody's face. So so that that that's what perhaps gives it its its special power. And if the mask, if it's not actually an object, but a thing, then it then it it has a life. So we have to think of the materials in relation to a notion of of life. And I missed it. What what material because when you held it up my picture became very small. Um, what material is it made of? Is a skin, the skin of Koti. Oh yes, of course. You said the skin is, and that's a that's a kind of deer, right? Yeah. Um. So it has some fur on the other side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Right. So so that that um. Actually, that makes it. I hadn't thought about that. It makes it all the more interesting because it's actually skin. Right. And 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 this, there's also the skin on your own face and 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 it's hairy on one side. And, and there are all these ideas about how if you um, how um, uh, it, 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 that how beings can 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 be covered in hair and then they remove their face and they're revealed in a human form. That that's in relation to all these ideas about perspectivism. I think there there might even be a be a connection there in which there, there's a there's a sense in which you're metamorphosing between the animal and and the human. So I would have to think about the materials all in um all in that connection. Um which takes us a fairly far away from the other question you asked about what we can learn of materials from people who who work with them. So I, th I think that, that in a way there are two separate issues. There's the issue of how we understand the mask as the skin and the face and the wearing and all that. And then there's the issue about what we can learn from materials by by working with them. And, and, um, um, and the main thing that we can learn, I think, and might be important for design is that whenever we think of something as material rather than as an object you're pointing to the possibility of it becoming something and the object is what it is but a, when you say something is a material it, it can become this or it can become that you have a piece of wood it could be a chair it could be a table we don't know yet and it's the job of the skilled craftsman to bring that out so so the movement from objects to materials is a movement from the being of things the the objectness of things to potential to to pure so materials become pure potential and i, I think that is what we learn from working with uh, with skilled practitioners how to understand stuff as pure potential Rather than as uh, as as, full, for, uh, as being in an object form, hmm. so thank you. I think that's as far as I can take that one. Thank you a lot. Obrigada. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Tim. Now um, we'll we'll have a third question, also from a PhD candidate in design at the Design and Anthropology Laboratory at ESG, who is Caio Calafati. Please, Caio. Hi, everyone. Can you listen to me? Okay. And thank you, Professor Ingold, Tim. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here with you. And my name is Caio Calafati. I'm an architect working in design practice and also in academia as a researcher and professor. 
Uh, in my PhD research guided by Professor Anastasakis, I researched ground as an idea in the field of architecture, especially in the configuration of the territory of Rio de Janeiro city. Uh, taking hills down and land filling beaches and lagoons are radical operations of land modification, which have been largely used in, in Rio de Janeiro history. As such, they have a central role in the definition of the culture of urban design based on intervention over the natural environment. Rio de Janeiro city center is a set of marshy region between mountains, hills, lagoons, and the Guanabara Bay, and thus has been built through dismounts and embankments. And here I can show you a, a picture of a dismount of Sant Antonio Hill, which was a very radical and violent operation here. And in your book, Being Alive, in the chapter Culture on the Ground, you criticize the hylomorphical model, as you said to Ilana, and which is found in, in the relationship between Hélène Murphy and the, how you said the, the, the colonization idealized and uh, uh, made this Aristotelian doctrine uh, where go, uh, form governs material, imprinting its rationality on it, assuming the colonization from one to the other in the colonization way. You seem to refuse the, the idea that the landscape surface is thus supposed to present itself as a palimpsest for the inscription of cultural form. You say your argument, your quote, uh, quoting, your argument is that, that to the contrary, that the forms of the landscapes, like the identities and the capacities of its human inhabitants, are not imposed upon a material substract but rather emerges as a condensation and crystallizations of activity within a relational field. Uh, for me, this key radically questioned the epistemology of design in Western world, in Western world, based on the material form opposition. And alternatively, you present the conjunction material flow following materials as a model that can guide us to another um, ontology. And my question is, how can we design architecture in cities in this key? What could be the instruments that can architects work with, within it? Within? And what is the status of the drawing issues in this model? And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I, I have actually, since writing the things you are talking about in uh, Being Alive, I, I've thought a lot more about the ground. In fact, I've just been thinking about it very recently, and and um, and, and um, a, the, the problems are rather similar to the ones in thinking about the, in responding to Marina about the the, the face and the mask, um, and that is that that in in much urban design, it is assumed that the ground is a hard surface. Um, and and as, as a hard surface, it has a top side and an underside, so that so that when you build on the city, you first seal it by covering it with a hard layer of concrete or asphalt or whatever it is, so that the earth, which is all moist and damp and full of germs and so on, is is, is sealed underneath, and the air and the atmosphere is on top, and there's no exchange between them. I mean, on on a hard surfaced ground nothing can actually grow. So, so in the modern architectural imagination, I think we imagine the ground as this kind of flat, hard surface. And then we, then we put buildings on it. But really the ground isn't like that at all. A ground, if you take a ground, just the earth, then it doesn't have two sides, it just has one. You can dig down into it, you can go above it, but, but the ground is actually where the, the atmosphere and the earth actually interpenetrate and mix up. And when anything grows, it's because the atmosphere and the earth are, are getting mixed. The water from the atmosphere mixes with the, 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 the nutrients from the earth, and so plants can grow. So, so what we call the ground is not really a, uh, a double-sided surface at all. It's 
um, it's a place where the earth and the atmosphere come together. It's a kind of zone of intermingling. And, and what I was imagining was this. What, what would happen if we imagine buildings as, um, as not erected upon a solid base, but planted in the earth? which is actually what happens, because in order to build lay a large block of flats, you first have to dig a re- very big hole. You have to dig the foundations. And, and foundation building is a very complex process, because often, as, as in Rio, I mean, there, there, there was an environment very swampy, very wet. If you try and build a foundation in those conditions, you have first of all to, um, to reinforce the walls of the foundations, otherwise all the water will come in and and flood it. So so you have this challenge as to how to create a foundation within a medium, the earth, which is actually fairly fluid. So I began to wonder what if we imagined um what if we imagined that the city was an ocean and the buildings were actually ships that were sailing in this ocean. Uh, what? How then would we would we think about buildings differently? And I think we really would, because if you were if you were um, on a ship at sea, you're not really interested in the surface of the sea. You're interested in what is down below, and you're interested in what is above. And that's what you've got to know about. What the winds, the currents. You've got to know about all those things in order to sail the ship. So. It's um, it's not the it's not the surface of the ground that is or the surface of the sea that is important, but what is above and below. Now, if you if you thought the same way about buildings, imagine you think of a building actually as a ship sailing in the earth, and that what really matters is the not the state of the ground, but the relationship between the earth and the atmosphere. And if we designed buildings in that kind of way, as places to gr- also as, as places not just for people to live and work, but as places to grow food, uh, then which I think is necessary uh, in the future, then then we would have a completely different view, I think, of what the city is or, or what it could be. So that that's what I find exciting. At the moment, how it would relate to drawing, I'm not sure, um, because um, because drawing is 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 linear, and we're talking here about volumes um, and, and and their stability, and I and um, I don't know except except that that. It, it it maybe comes down to this question of of, of computer as, computer assisted design and the extent to which when we're designing things these days so much of it is done on a screen and the screen offers a flat homogeneous surface and there may be a parallel between the way we imagine the screen on which we design and the way we imagine the ground as this flat homogeneous surface on which we build and if we could move and the extent if we could move in our both in our practices of building but and planning but also in our practices of designing to stop thinking about this smooth homogeneous surface and think much more about finding our way through a fluid medium then i think that would be a, a way forward thanks i think that's my <laughs> my best possible answer to that one Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Caio. Thank you, Tim. Now I, Paula de Oliveira Camargo, who I am also a PhD candidate in design at Plada ESG, and I graduated in architecture and have a master's in history, so very um, broad range of studies. Um, I will ask my own question, the fourth one, we have, we still have five after that. that. Um, so I, I took a reference from your book, Making Anthropology, Archaeology, Art and Architecture. Um, um, and I quote, 
just as science has invested heavily in the distinction between specu speculative theory and experimental practice, so has architecture invested in that between design and construction. The architect then conceives the lineaments of the structure, while the builder's task is to unite the structure with the material. These definitions, however, belie the creativity, the creativity of the messy practices that give rise to real buildings, whether sketching, tracing, modeling, staking out, digging, cutting, laying, fixing or joining, all involve care, judgment and aforethought and are carried on within worldly fields of forces and relations. None can be placed unequivocally on one side or the other of any distinction or fundamental ontological import, such as between intellectual conception and mechanical execution. On what, ground, on what grounds then, if at all, can architecture be distinguished from building or more generally design from making? This is from the book Making on pages 57 and 59, um, chapter on building a house. And my question is, since I graduated in architecture and have this master's in history, I and also work in the municipality of Rio, um, I am currently doing slash undergoing my PhD research in design in which I investigate the uses of words such as design, architecture, and strategy in different discourses, especially in the discourse of the public administration in Rio as a means to composing or making a desired public image of the self, of one professional, of, a, of someone, of, of this professional person. Um, I understand that many architects desire to distinguish themselves and leave their permanent marks on earth by building or having built, which, is, which seems more appropriate, the most sustainable, like, livable, tall, efficient, beautiful, green, so on, building of the world, of, the, of contemporary architecture, and so it goes. Um, so in an era in which image is mediated all the time, architects and designers can reach the status of internet celebrities and influencers in their social media profiles, and their, their designs become less important than the image of their designs, and even of their personal lives. I wonder where, then, the core of the architects and designers making stands, if not in the building and not even in the, in the designing itself. Can the making of a self-promoted image be considered as the new equivalent to drawing, and, to drawing and building? Thus, do you see making as a means in itself, but not necessarily as a means to achieving something? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, what, what, what I thought about when I was reading your question is, um, is something I actually was writing about just a few months ago. I wrote a paper called um, In Praise of Amateurs. And I was, I was thinking about the changing meaning of professionalization and, and how um, we, we, th there's a good argument to say that we should go back to amateur study, a kind of study that we do for the love of it as a way of living one's life. And, and um, uh, wh wh whereas in the last 20 or 30 years, the years of uh, neoliberalism, um, the, the professional has become one who um, develops a curriculum vitae, uh, who can sell his or her uh, abilities on the market, a special expertise, and 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 so somehow, where, where originally the um, the profession was a calling, a vocation, or indeed a way of living one's life, the the profession has now become uh, something that could be recorded on a curriculum vitae, and 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 this has happened, uh, I should think, in in in, in architecture as well. Um, so what I was thinking about was the relationship between the life's work, that is a life that is devoted to 
uh, some particular area of study, some particular area of activity, it could be architecture, it could be musical composition, it could be anthropology, whatever. The connection between the life's work and a curriculum vitae, which consists of a list, a list of achievements, which are added up to make up a total. And, and we are supposed these days to devote our lives to adding up all these all these achievements and and it's it's that totality of achievements that the celebrity then says look look at me look at all the things i've done i've done this and i've done that and i've done that and i've done that so so we get a, a, a distinction a tension actually which um which many of us experience um because we are both scholars and more practitioners and at the same time we hold positions in various kinds of institutions that we all experience a tension between what we feel of as, as our life's work and the way we have to present it in a neoliberal world as a, a sequence, an added up sequence of achievements that can be recorded in a list. And, and and what occurred to me was that there is a connection between that distinction, between the life's work and the curriculum vitae, and two different ideas of what it means to make things. And one is making us a series of, of, of additions, of putting one thing after another after another, and the other is making us growing. So, uh, and... Um, in the making book, I want I really wanted to try and develop an idea of of what it means to make things or what it means to build things where it's almost impossible to distinguish between making and growing, where, where actually what we're calling making is is a process, a, a, an ontogenetic process. And you could divide it up into all these different stages from planning to execution. But really, we know that it's one continuous process. I mean, just as with a plant. You could say, well, there's the, the germination of the seed, there's the initial sprouting, there's the production of the leaves and then the flowers. So you could divide the life of a plant up into all these different stages. But we know that these are all part of one single process of ontogenesis. And we could, we could describe the life of a building in just the same way as a kind of growth project process. But if we wanted to present it um, in, in the way that you described your celebrity architects now, you wouldn't do it like that. You would, you would want to present it as, or, or maybe if you're an architect, you'd say, I did this building, and then I did this building, and then I looked did this building, and look at them all and how wonderful they are. So you would, you would set it up as, um, not as, as this process of, of growth, but as a, an aggregate sum of achievements. So I think actually there is a relation between this distinction between thinking of making as an additive process and making as a process of growth, and the way in which the architect might have presented him or herself a long time ago as somebody who follow, is following a vocation, a calling, and the architect now who has a brand, who is marketing their own particular personae on the basis of a, of a curriculum vitae. Um, so that I don't know if if this makes sense to you, but but it it seemed to me to to make a certain degree of 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 sense. So um, that's my answer. I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Makes perfect sense. And now um, we will proceed to the fifth question from Ana Rita Ferreira, Master in Contemporary Arts and PhD candidate in anthropology at STU Lisbon. I would say no. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, everyone uh, in here at Zoom and uh, YouTube. And thank you, Tim, for being here with us today. So um, as Paulo said, my name is Ana Santos and, and I am currently a PhD candidate in anthropology in Lisbon at ISCTE UL. And I have a master's in contemporary arts. Um, and in my, in my research, I use art 
I use the, the art practice as a vehicle to be connected physically with the subjects that I'm collaborating in, in collaboration with. Those are amputees and body hackers. So the relation between body and technology is in discourse with the continuous performance on learning how to be in the world through, through their, their potentiality. This question is actually wider than my actual research and concerns the relation to, the relation to art that is also anthropological. On the first page of your paper written in 2016 called From Science to Art and Back Again, the pendulum of an anthropologist, you suggest that there is a shift in practices in which science didn't take much part of and now artists are the ones that make science. If we, if we bring into this discussion pedagogy, pedagogy, and dedication concerning how the academy teaches the practice of anthropology, we perhaps can find a gap in terms of recognition of art practices as a study of being and doing with the world. Why do, do these relations, art, anthropology, tend to often fail in terms of academic recognition in the way of practicing science, but also, also producing it? What strategies could you suggest to students and also teachers to revert this? Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. This is a massive question, and it's a question I've been thinking about a lot. It's a question of how we can how we can bring back art and anthropology and other sorts of things at, at the very heart of our pedagogical practice, not as something extra, but as something um, absolutely central to it. And, and you know that at the moment there have been a lot of discussions about the relationship between science and art. Sometimes they involve anthropology, sometimes they don't. But, but in most of these discussions, um, art has been seen as a kind of complement to science. So that, um, so that people are still, most, most, most educational theorists are still wedded to a kind of enlightenment project of education, a project in which we take these ignorant children and we educate them so that they eventually become civilized, they can take forward the, the project of civilization. So that education then is a project of, of emancipation and enlightenment in which we take these, these, the raw material of humans and turn them into wonderfully um, civilized beings and and the, and the argument goes that um, it, it's off, obviously important that these uh, people learn science and learn knowledge about the world but that also needs to be that that objective knowledge that that, that knowledge of science needs to have its complement something subjective something empathetic something that will cultivate individual powers of of expression so that so that the, the individual human being can emerge as a rounded entity, uh, somebody who uh, is both knowledgeable about the realities of the world, but is also um, capable of, 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 of empathy, of emotional feeling, of self-expression. And, and so the dominant view is that, is that art provides that extra complement. I mean, it's linked to this, this idea that, you know, we are all split beings. We have a right brain and a left brain and the, and the left brain is good at uh, rational thinking and the right brain is good at emotion. And, uh, and to produce balanced human beings, we have to cultivate both. But the trouble with that complementary, complementarity approach is that it doesn't in any way challenge the dominance of uh, of, of a scientific and technological um, worldview and, 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 the, and the powers that sustain it. And, and I think um, that we need to have a much, much more um, radical approach, which means actually questioning the very idea that the purpose of education, that the purpose of pedagogy is to enlighten individual human beings. And I, I go back to, 
to the educational philosophy of John Dewey, which is to say, no, the purpose of education is to secure the continuity of life. That, that, that it's the way, education is the way a society makes its future, but a sustainable future is one that can actually carry on. Uh, and that actually means that we have to detach the idea of pedagogy from the dominant notion that it's about progress. Um, I've, I've actually come to the conclusion that sustainability and progress are not compatible. And if we're going to aim for sustainability, for the continuity of life, to set in place uh, the procedures, the educational forms that allow uh, every generation to carry on uh, and renew life from the generation before, then we have to stop thinking about education as a means of progress towards an enlightened, better, more prosperous future, and think of education more as a conversation in which the old and the young can join together in conversation and mutually transform one another in, in the process. And, and the thing is, in doing that, then um, one is actually introducing um, the practices of art as a form of education in itself. I, I, I read recently this, this wonderful book by, by the educational theorist um, Gert Biester. Uh, it's called um, Letting Art Teach. And, and his basic argument is that rather than educating people in art, we should allow art itself to be the form that education takes. And that form is about showing things, that art brings things to our attention and says, look at this. This is something that might be worthy of study. And that is the purpose of art. In fact, it came up recently in a, in a discussion I was having with some another group um, that was looking at, at the relationship between art and education. And, and, and suddenly occurred, they were thinking, what can we do to bring art into schools? And I said, look, what we should do is to treat the school itself as a work of art, a collective work of art. And, and, and that's exactly it, that, that rather than trying to introduce um, art and anthropology and other things into the curriculum or try and strengthen their position, what we really need to do is to turn the whole educational process into an artistic or anthropological project. It's why I've been trying to persuade my anthropological colleagues that the real purpose of anthropology is not ethnography, as they insist, but education. Uh, that that's what, what anthropology exists to do. It's as a form of education, not in the enlightenment sense of depositing uh, knowledge, but in the sense of leading us out into a world, showing us a way along which we might be able to continue. And, 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 and so, but, but this, this requires such a shift in our understanding of what education is and what its purpose in this society that I don't know how we should achieve it, but, but maybe the first step is to be clear about what it is that we're actually trying to, to get at and proposing that, well, let's let, add a bit of art to the curriculum is not uh, the way uh, to go about it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Tim. Um, now, Ju Julia Sa uh, mas Master in Architecture and Urbanism, PhD candidate in Anthropology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, IFIX, UFRJ, will ask the th sixth question. Hi, Julia. everyone. Hi, can you listen to me? It's okay. Hi, Tim. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to me to be here. I'm very nervous. So my name is Julia. I'm candidate in anthropology of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And I will make my question for you. I will read. On the very first pages of your book, Lines, A Brief History, you talk about the project of colonial occupation to contextualize the violent colonizing gesture highlighting the Western imposition of its lines on the re rest of the world, destroying others, 
possibilities of lifelines. On the other hand, in our dialogue with Peter Gao, in this same book, we see how Amerindian people build their lifelines from the relationships that they weave with other differentiated beings, incorporating other lines on their bodies and objects aesthetics. White people are also seen as lines and surfaces in relation with Amerindians, as we go into your formulation about alterity as nonlinear. In my research with the Kayapo people, their dresses are seen as white people clothing at the same time that they are identified by them as Kayapo dresses and we use curiously translated from, from them as Kayapo as for their language as white people skins used by women as another layer that reaffirms Kayapo identity in a game of appropriation and transformation of white colonial elements. Thus, while still caring for the scars generated by the violent presence of Western culture among Amerindians, how do you see this process of overlap and transformation of these so-called colonial lines carried out by indigenous societies nowadays? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very, very interesting study. And of course, I don't know enough about it to, to be able to comment with any, any authority. But, but, it, but, but it seemed to me that this is not really so much a question of, about lines as a question about surfaces. And I, I've, I really got interested in surfaces recently. And, and because we're talking about uh, two kinds of surface here, uh, materially two kinds. One is the surface of the dress, which is um, a cloth of some kind, fabric, and the other is the surface of the skin. And uh, I don't know whether Kayapo, but other uh, Amerindian, Amazonian people that would, would have um, in the past, maybe still today, um, uh, decorate their skin um, with patterns uh, a lot. Uh, uh, so um, indeed, where they might not have been wearing very much else, but they would certainly have um, have, have covered their skins with with designs. So, so what the, the interesting thing it, and and the other thing. Um, so there's that. It's that 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 we have this contrast between the the European habit of um, of covering the skin up with with, with cloth like, as against the Kayapo habit of, um, of 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 painting the skin itself. Um, but then there's also. Uh, the same question that arose when I was talking to Marina about that mask uh, as to whether uh, clothing is uh, seen as something that covers up or something that reveals. Uh, and uh, and, and it, I, reading what you said, it seemed probably that the Kayopo are doing a very sophisticated play on both of these things is so so sophisticated that I, I couldn't really follow it. But but that is that they're they're both playing on the idea that um, clothing both covers up and reveals. So um, that means that on the one hand um, they could maybe disguise themselves as white people at the same time as saying, well, actually um, we're not. Um, we're not disguising ourselves at all, but we're showing who we really are. Um, but at the same time, they could also say, "Look, um, this is this is this is a dress. This is a covering." But hey, wait a moment! It's not because this dress is equivalent to the way we would paint our skin, so it's not a covering at all. So, so there, there are all these these ambiguities that play on on the double status of a surface like a fabric or the skin as to whether it is something that covers up what is on the other side of it, or whether it is something that reveals, uh, or whether it has two, two sides, let's say, but two sides like um, a fabric, or one side um, like, like the skin. And it's too complicated for me to understand all the, all the uh, ins and outs of, of it, but 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 you could say that, the, that these ambiguities provide a wonderful kind of resource, a metaphorical resource perhaps, that people can manipulate, uh, maybe to 
um, try and say one thing to white interlocutors, but another thing quietly to their own Kayapo people. I mean, often you find that 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 behind saying one thing to the to a to a to a to a public of white people, um, people are actually saying something completely different amongst themselves, which the white people don't understand at all. It's a it's a bit like moving between an indigenous language and a, and a, and the um, the main one. Um, so. Um, I don't know if that makes sense because it, you, you, one would need to know so much about it. But, but I think that, that rather than thinking about lines in this case, thinking about the surfaces and different ways in which surfaces can be understood would, would maybe offer, um, offer more uh, ideas. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, th thank you Tim. Um, now, the researchers from, me, from NIDA, the Nucleus of Research in Innovation, Design and Anthropology at the Federal University of Maranhão, UFMA, will pose their questions and Professor Raquel Noronha will present, will present NIDA. Okay, thank you, Paula. Hello, everybody. Thank you, team, for coming for this conversation with us. Uh, for us at NIDA, it's an amazing time to, to meet you here. And since we were uh, with you in Aberdeen for the first time in 2017, Zoe and I, and I am sure it's also happened to her, our way of thinking about and making design changed. And we at NIDA, in both undergraduate and master's in design, we dedicated a lot of time and energy to build a design by means of anthropology in correspondence to your anthropology by means of design. Those days in 2018 changed my way of researching and in every conversation we had there with you, with Caroline Gett and many other people, uh, it still impacts our actions and the way we write, the way we live the academic life. The lines met and continued to flow. Since then, we have been experimenting with materials, uh, things and thinking uh, how to make and to, and to design beyond the modernist restrictions, uh, pushing the limits of representation of the others, um, going uh, beyond the idea of design as a colonial technology. Every time we resume uh, your readings and introduce you to a new student, it's always an emotion. And if you were, as if you were discovering your readings for the first time. Thank you so much for this. Uh, before starting the NIDA's questions, I'd like to thank a lot Lada for this partnership and for the invitation to be here. And also to Zoe with my special affection, thank you. So I'm going to the first question. It's a question of mine. And I'm very interested in questions about uh, limits of representation, uh, dealing with the limits of design field, power and politics. And I'm basing my question in this text letters from Krakow in the book Correspondences from 2017. So it's an interview, letters from Krakow. Uh, in this interview, you were talking about the problems of representation and power. In your answer, uh, a question addressed to the place of power and politics in your work. In our studies at NIDA, your work in, is inspiring us to think about power relations as in the way we are thinking about and doing research in design. Note that I'm using in this, in this question, design in caps to make a difference to the design knowledge field. For us in Brazil, design is seldom or never used as a verb, but as a, a noun. In dialogue with you, we are proposing a design by means of anthropology. So we are researching by means of correspondences. And here at Maranhão, the place I live, uh, the reality you describe in your example in page uh, 137 is actually present 
in our quotidian lives. I'm going to, to read this part, this, quote, this quotation. Um, I was talking recently to a student who is back from doing field work in Kenya. He spoke of the situation of cattle pastoralists who were unable to take the cattle down to the edge of the lake to drink because the land around the edge of the lake had been had all been appropriated by uh, wealthy landowners who were using the land to cultivate crash crops. Uh, here was a very typical sort of situation involving power, relationships, and a struggle for land and water. Obviously, if you are a pastoralist, your cows need to drink, but they cannot get to the water if their paths is blocked by a fence. One person's line is being blocked by another. It seemed, it seemed to me uh, that to talk of lines and movements and of how one kind of line can block another, take us to the heart of the problem in a way that abstract talk of power, relations, or politics cannot. It takes us straight here. So my question is, these, issue, these issues of representation and description also present in design are the results of deep power relations. In Brazil, as in Latin America, there is a movement claiming for decolonizing design as we have decolonizing many other, the, we have this claim for decolonizing many other knowledge fields in many places around the world. In your opinion, how would we deal with these multiple lines of power that guide the emergence of intersubjective relations actually between living beings, materials, and environments to think about emergent, emergent pathways to design? Thank you, Raquel. That's, that, that's a really, really difficult, difficult question. And I, I, I don't really know, know, know the answer to it. I, uh, in, in the passage that you read out, uh, what I wanted to, there was an implicit criticism, critique, I think, in that passage, and it's a critique of a certain kind of abstract theorizing about power. And, and I feel that I, I've, I, I often feel dissatisfied with, with a lot of the the academic literature, in, well, in anthropology in particular, that, that, that talks a great deal about power relations. And, and you can see what they're talking about, and, and that you can see that the, the power relations are there. But, but as soon as, uh, as, soon as a um, particular, very particular thing like, my cow cannot get through that fence, is re-described as a power relation. It is somehow dematerialized. It is somehow abstracted. It becomes part of a, a discourse that that seems somehow removed from um, uh, from those direct issues, pr problems that that confront people in in everyday life. You need to get. A drink for your cow. I mean, it's as, as simple as that. And and um, and 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 my feeling is that that we can better address these massive questions of power that we have to address if we're going to decolonize our agendas by showing how they really work out for real people in real life situations rather than in terms of a, of a sort of generalized, uh, very abstract um, kind of dynamic. And I was partly responding to criticism that, that is always being made. I, I, I get this all the time. Why don't I deal with politics? Or why don't I, wh wh where is the power? I, I, I'm talking about this perceptional lines, whatever it is, and people say, where's the conflict? Where are the power relations? And I should say, and, and I want to say, yes, yes, they are there. But, but, but we are so used to thinking of power as something very big and something very abstract that we actually don't see it when it's right under our noses in, in a particular event. 
this cow not being able to get to the lake because there's a fence in the way and that and and um, and I, I I'm I, I I would like to be able to develop a a vocabulary that allows us to talk about these kinds of events and realize that that by going deep into them we can we can find we don't have to we don't have to to go up into some grandiose abstractions we can actually find the things that are really concerning us down there and and i'm not even sure that the word power in the end is particularly helpful um just because it is so general so abstract and because it means can mean anything and it, it's not always negative either there are forms of power that are very positive so i i i, I just feel that I, i would like to be able to to get down from power into things that are much more um much more real actually for um for 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 ordinary people in 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 ordinary life situations and and that might be part of the effort of decolonizing i mean what, what, be, be, because i could just add one thing uh one of the one of the most difficult things about the decolonizing thing is that is that in the very particularly in the academic world in the very process of trying to decolonize our discourses our ways of teaching and so on we are actually reproducing it and we are reproducing it by reproducing an elite academic vocabulary uh, an elite way of talking so that so that there are powerful people going around saying we are leading the decolonizing agenda but they are they are colonizing the world with their own academic discourses and insisting that the rest of us follow on uh, so we 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 have not lost the the academic um hierarchy uh, which is which which sometimes is 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 being reproduced by those discourses that are claiming to address the questions of power um that's not very clearly spelt out but it but but anyway it's that's just because i'm getting fed up with pompous academics really and <laughs> and their way of talking and and i don't think it helps yeah thanks thank you tim hakel um i think you will read the next question as well right which is from some of your fellow researchers at NIDA. Yes, I'm going to, to read the next question for Samuel Miranda, Master in Design, Gloriana Alpzar, also Master in Design from NIDA, and, from, and by Caroline, uh, Caroline Pedraça, uh, Master Candidates, also from NIDA Ultima. Um, they, they bring uh, a, a quote from, from the text materials are, uh, that's enough about ethnography from 2014. Um, to observe means to watch what is going on around and about, and of course, to listen and feel as well. To participate means to do, to do so from within the current activity in which you carry on a life alongside and together with the persons and things to capture your attention. We at NIDA work with intense manual work and the relations with the materials involve the use of natural raw material. In these researches, the, there is a very close body contact with the artisans. The materials become meetings, meeting points in the fabric of life. In addition to influencing the flow of relationships. Our research has been directly affected by the pandemic as we have avoided face-to-face -face contact and assumed a safe distance from these meetings. How do you see a way to continue your research but without losing the sense of our work, taking into account the importance of contact and making together 
since this distance doesn't affect working with them and not doing a study of them in the same text. Thank you. And there, there were two things that, that occurred to me as I was reading this question. And, and one is about um, the meaning of face-to-face -face contact. And the other one is about what it means to talk about distance um, between people. Um, the, the face we, we often say that 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 you're working face to face is a is a very sociable way, a way of going along together and doing things together. And you, um, Samuel, spoke about about working with materials um, together with other people. You're working face to face, and the and the problems then that come up when when. Um, this, the pandemic makes this um, uh, dangerous or, or, or difficult, um, but 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 actually, um, strict face-to-face -face contact is is not the most sociable form of going along together. In fact, it can be quite antagonistic. Um, so you think if you really want to infect another person with this horrible virus, why you stand face to face with them and cough in their face. It's actually um, that face-to-face -face encounter is, um, and, and, and there have been instances of this where people have deliberately done this, um, is, is extremely aggressive, extremely hostile, um, in, in just the same way as even before there was any risk of a virus, if somebody just if, if, uh, stared at another person in the face and, and said something really nasty, swore at them, again, it would be a very... Um, hostile, aggressive act, and the other person would feel um, hurt and wounded. Um, obviously, not all face-to-face -face relations are like that. However, it is, um, it is not the, the most sociable uh, form of activity. And actually, when you're working with other people on materials, you're probably not looking at them face-to-face. -face. You're probably both looking at the material that is being worked on sharing the same view, so that you would be looking maybe slightly towards one another, but not directly face to face. You, you'd both be looking. It's like, like if you're walking down the street together, if two people are walking down the street together, side by side, and many people say that's a very sociable, very warm thing to do. They're not looking at one another. They're both sharing the view ahead, but maybe with the heads tilted just a little way so that you can but not, not directly at them. So, um, so one way to deal with the situation is to say face-to-face -face contact might be a little bit dangerous, but what about going along side by side where well, you're not breathing at the other person at all because you're both breathing actually in the same direction and, and the risk of infection, actually, the people walking along side by side is very low indeed because the virus is coming straight out of their, out of their mouths. It's not going off um, on, on, on the side. So, so that's one thing. And the, the other thing is about um, distance, so simply to make the point that um, that metric distance is not the same as affective distance. Um, it's a fairly obvious point, but, but you can't measure how affectively close you are to another person by measuring out the number of centimeters between you and 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 that other, in fact, they're 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 completely separate things. Um, so that one can be feel affectively close to somebody who's on the other side of the world. If you if you've received a, a letter or nowadays an email from somebody on the other side of the world, they're a long way away physically, but they might you feel um, that they're right there. In, in your your presence so um, so these are different things and and what we are talking about here is affective uh, closeness and we, 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 we can think of ways as indeed we're doing now on this zoom we can actually be close to one another even though socially called socially distanced this, this whole phrase social distancing, is 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 such a wrong-headed notion? It really is. Um, 
many people have said it ought, ought simply to be called physical distancing because there's really nothing social about it at all. It's got nothing to do with social life. It's simply got to do with um, with two meters. You know, it, and, and it's got nothing that, that says nothing about, about social relations. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raquel and Tim. This very, very inspiring answer. Um, now the last question from the program's researchers before we proceed to the questions posed by our audience on Zoom and YouTube. Zita Gonzalez, Master in Design from the Federal University of Maranhão, please. Hi. Uh, do you hear me? Um, I'm just facing, facing some problems with my internet because I recently, like five minutes ago, I had a blackout here in my building. So I don't know if it will work, uh, my internet. I'm only with my internet in, in <laughs> um, my cell phone. So I hope it work. So I will start. Tell me if we, you cannot hear me, please. Yeah, I can hear you very well, so don't worry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Ita Gonzalez. I'm from Mexico. And um, recently, I finished my master's degree here in Maranhão at UFMA. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here in this Zoom room. <laughs> especially being here uh, in front of you, our special guest, uh, Tim Mingo. In the last... It's not working. It's not working. No? Uh, I'm going to, to read your question. Hello? OK. OK. Uh, so I'm going to read Sita's question. Uh, I had the joy to see the past live talk uh, of Schumacher School here in Brazil, where you spoke about this correspondence between people of different generations focusing specifically in education, education through uh, thought as a way of communicating and transmission elaborated by Dewey where their capacity is to respond and being responded as I said, as said by Ingold in 2018, uh, Anthropology and as Education, where in a quotation, uh, where their pro purpose is to bring young and elder people together in this way, social life can continue. Uh, taking this into account, I would like to know your opinion on general, uh, generational generational young and elder people correspondence at the workplace and in general work in cities inside the capitalism system. Uh, I am interested in talking about working in the cities since I have been working with textile artisans in the south of Mexico in a semi-autonomous Mayan community called Yochip for my master's research. And the way in which these artisans work is with this generational correspondence term that I put in the table to exemplify the correspondence between young and elder groups, because they have these family groups formed by only women within the family, like grandmother, mother, sisters, daughters, mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law, etc. And their way of textile production and creation is through this correspondence between generations, while the backstrap loom technique is taught. It is also worked on. And for that, I'd like to know your opinion of the possibility of this generational correspondence, thinking about work in the in contemporaneity, visualizing this form of education through storytelling at work, in the cities for the future. 
that Sita's question. So well, thank thank you very much, and I, I hope Sita you can you can hear um, anyway something something of this. Um, actually, I, I I I was in, interested to read about the the Maya and the uh, women and with the backstrap loom because I I do remember reading somewhere um, an article which which was talking about. Maya women with the back strap loom and pointing out that um, that 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 children or baby girls uh, when they are born already have an aptitude to work with the loom because they've been in their mother's womb all the time when the mother's been weaving. And and they've they've developed through the most formative nine months of their lives with the rhythm uh, uh, of the of the mother's body and uh, moving with this, so that when uh, when they 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 they're born and they they get a little bit older, um, it's absolutely natural that they 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 simply know the the movements for the weaving um, themselves, which is kind of fascinating. That 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 they know is that the, this correspondence. Um, between mothers and daughters uh, starts even before the daughter's born, <laughs> when it's still in in the womb, which I think is, is is a fascinating thing. But 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 what they're showing us is 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 what through most of history, most people, most children have learned through most of history, through being around as their old elders have been doing stuff, sitting, watching, learning, uh, and um, and that process has gone on um, through life. So that the metaphor that I've used to talk about it is like a, a rope in which every generation is like a strand of the rope, but the generations are twisting around one another. And because so long as they twist around one another, so long as there's this contact between young and old, then um, the rope will carry on. The young will uh, absorb ways of doing things, learn ways of doing things, and in turn, Teach, and this is a, isn't about transmitting knowledge. It's about carrying knowledge on through um, working together. And the great tragedy, I think, of of modernity is that we now have an educational system which um, which, which puts the very young and the very old on opposite sides, so they don't meet. There's no contact except in very exceptional situations between the young and the old. They're both excluded from the process of, of making a future, which is then placed in the hands of the, of the intermediate generation. And, and, um, and I think that this is something that urgently needs to be addressed. What I don't know is whether it can, it's possible to change things within a, a capitalist system in which um, work is understood as, as, as a marketable, um, uh, or where labor is a marketable commodity. Um, I, mean, I, I imagine that it's, it's, it's that system that has created the conditions in which young people are uh, trained up as the future labor force and old people then eventually retire from it. And, and therefore, in order to create an educational system in which the young and old can come together, one would have to fundamentally alter those conditions of, of labor. Uh, one would have to understand labor in a very different kind of way. Um, and, and I suppose that's not really compatible with a capitalist system. The difficulty is that, that I, I understand that the, the, the troubles of the world at the moment, that what we're living through is the collapse of, of neoliberalism, the most extreme form of capitalism, without anybody knowing what is going to come in its place. Um, uh, we can have all sorts of experiments but we don't know, we don't have a model to work towards. But I think if, 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 we, if we could think about the way we think about generations, 
and their succession, I think we really is important. And we have to think about how to change that relation instead of always thinking in terms of generational cohorts, the young, the middle-aged, the old. We have to stop thinking in terms of layers and think in turn, instead in terms of, of the way lives overlap. Um, and maybe the privations that people are experiencing during this pandemic will help us to think in new ways about this. Because they're making us realize things that we used to take for granted, the, uh, the importance of things we used to take for granted. We, the, it, it, it's forcing us to realize how important it is, actually, for, um, for, for children to spend time with their grandparents. And we took that for granted until the time comes when they can't spend time with their grandparents. And then people realize how important it is. So maybe we can, we can learn from it. And that looks like good timing because it's exactly half past eight. Uh, so, so we're right Thank on you session. very much. Yes, it's perfect. I think we've never been so right on schedule. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for all these generous answers. Now um, we will proceed to the questions that came from our audience. Thank you all for being here and for bringing such interesting questions for us this afternoon. As we have said, we don't have much time left, only half an hour. So we have selected some of the questions that appeared in the chats on Zoom and YouTube, edited some of them that were kind of similar, put some of them together. So um, we will try to address as many questions as possible in these next 30 minutes. Um, but we ap apologize in advance if anyone feels that their question was not addressed. Tim, um, we have selected four or five questions. We will see how the timing goes. And we have half an hour. So the first question comes from Zoom, from, um, from Professor Luciana Kaliman. Uh, she's a professor of psychology at UFES at Espírito Santo, Brazil, and she's now living in Lisbon. She says, um, I am a professor of psychology in Brazil and have a special interest in the, in the ecological studies of attention. And this is why I come to know your work. Then my first question is related to that. Starting from the importance that attention or attentionality finds in your work, I would like to know if you draw any relationship between your notion of correspondence and joint attention or shared attention that comes from de developmental psychology, but recently has been rethought by Yves Titon works, especially on his book for an ecology of attention. For Titon, um, joint attention is characterized by affective attunement, co-presence, co reciprocity, and improvisation. And these are characteristics that constitute an attentional environment that is cultivated and not intrinsic to a person. I was wondering if you could talk about that and if you could do an, any approximation with the work of Fernand Deligny, who also uses the spider or the, or the arachnian to think about the human. He has one of the great influences of the thought of the lines of Deleuze and Guattari when talking about the lines of wandering with autistic, ch autistic children. At the same time, it seems, that, it seems to me that it is all at the heart of Delany's, Delany's work to question the volition, agency, intentionality triad. There is also a profound criticism of how to be guided by the project, the plan in opposition to a way of being with and in the environment. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, we, Yves Citon uh, is a is a is a colleague in a way, and I, I and we're very much in agreement on most things. Uh, that that I, in fact, I would have to sit down and work out if there's anything that uh, Yves and I are are actually seriously disagreed on. But our our, our way of of um, approaching the question of attention. Um, 
is is very similar. I think if uh, too has been influenced as I have by by Gibsonian ecological psychology um, and also by by developmental biology. I, I was reading a long time ago work by um, developmental psychologists who were working with a Gibsonian perspective, looking at the development of joint attention, for example, in relations between young children and, and adults and, and how it works. Um, and that certainly has been an influence on, on my way of thinking. Um, where at the, the, and, the, and the key point about it is that we think of attention as it's kind of like watching and listening. It's it's like you're you're going along together with maybe somebody else and something else going on, which you are both paying attention to as the action proceeds. And that's very different from the way in which cognitive psychologists often think about attention, where it, it it's more like stop stop pay attention it's uh, when when they talk about attention it's like um it's like focusing in on some fixed target um and that's not what i mean or, or it's not certainly not what if is sit on means either um they, for, for us attention is 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 a way of going along uh, together with um things but there is this ambiguity in the term which is important to point out on delini uh, I, uh, I I have his book. There's a, there's, there's a, a publication um, which is which is a, uh, a, about this fat um, of, of Delini's works, which um, I have on my shelf. Uh, only unfortunately, it's in storage at the moment with many of my other books. But um, but and and so I've not I've not studied them in depth, although I know I know about it. Um, and he was certainly an extraordinary character, and 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 the the relation to all with autism is is terribly important. Um, I think we can learn a lot from that. Um, one scholar who has developed it and whose thought has been very influential for me is is Erin Manning, and and what Manning says about autism is precisely that that um how to put this in in our ordinary everyday cognition we know almost immediately what things are or who people are and therefore how to deal with them it's but 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 there's a moment in which in which um things are not yet certain in which uh, which the the perceptions that assail us have not yet settled into a definite form and for most of us this is such a quick it it it, it passes by so quickly we we so we, it's so immediate our recognition of what something is that we don't realize that there's this little space when we're not sure about things and the, and and what matters for autism is that this period of uncertainty is stretched out sometimes it's stretched out indefinitely and that's where you get these wonderful spidery wandering lines that Delini uh, found from from the drawings of of the autistic children he was working with. And the point is that that we are all autistic to a degree, uh, and and this this state of uncertainty is one that um, is um, shouldn't be understood negatively, but it but it's hugely productive. And if it, in fact. More than that, if if it wasn't for that little bit of uncertainty, we would all be completely stuck. I mean, thought can move on, life can move on, precisely because there's this little bit of looseness uh, where 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 lines can wander and get detached. That allows movement. Without that, um, no movement would be possible at all. Um, and, and 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 so that's where where both Delini's lines and this notion of, of an attention that is going on uh, are in, important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now we have a second question that comes from YouTube. 
It's from Elisa Kushner, Friends of Handicraft School on St in Stockholm. And she says, hello, I am a weaver and I am currently researching the concept of imperfection in textile making. Having read some, some of your books during my master's studies at SG in Rio, I deeply agree that as makers, we should learn from materials and that the objects we make are necessarily a, a result of the negotiation between form and matter. During the process of making, a lot of things can go wrong. And I have been trying to highlight these moments in my work and research. However, I am constantly confronted with the, with the fact that this would be considered a piece of less quality or, per or perceived as such. I'd love to hear any insights you might have on the value of imperfections in crafts. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think imperfection is actually absolutely crucial to craft. Um, without, without imperfection, um, things would be almost, almost meaningless. Um, they would have no character. Um, they would bear nothing of the thought and feeling of, of a maker. Um, I know that in, in many cases, um, makers have deliberately introduced imperfections as a kind of signature. If they're making something for somebody else as a gift, they'll put that little imperfection in as a way of saying, hey, this is me and I'm thinking about you. So, because if there were no imperfections, there would be nothing, nothing that would be like the signature, not, nothing of the person of, of, of the maker. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's imperfections through which we, we learn about the maker and about the materials as well. Um, and in fact, in some ways, um, it's, a, it's a ridiculous idea, imperfection, because it can only be measured against a state of perfection, which um, nobody would ever attain. I mean, can, can you imagine such a thing, for example, as perfect handwriting? Everybody's handwriting is different. There's no perfect hand. Um, one might say there's some neat hands and some unneat hands, but, but, but the idea of perfection doesn't actually make sense. And just one other example, and I have to keep this brief, but, um, but, but with, with, with uh, mathematicians, I've been talking about circles and how at school, uh, children are told to draw a circle with a pencil and a compass and how it's impossible to draw a perfect circle because you can never make the, the pencil line even all the way around and you have to start somewhere and you end somewhere and where you start where the start and the end overlap, the line is bound to be thicker. And how in geometry, children are taught to disregard these imperfections, how, how the real thing is the perfect circle, but how mathematicians insist that actually it's these imperfections that allow, give us a deep understanding of what circularity actually means. And without them, we wouldn't have that understanding. The, the, the very essence of mathematical understanding lies in those very imperfections. Um, uh, the imperfections in that sense are, are, are generative, they're personal, and um, in a, uh, yeah, it, it, so, so we should, we should, we should um, treat them, we, we should give them a positive value, treat, treat them as, as, as generative, as, as, as ways in which things can begin, rather than as damaged goods. Okay, thank you very much. We have two more questions. The third question is from the chat on Zoom. It comes from Renato Perotto, master's student at University of Brasilia, UNB. Hi, Tim. Do you see the maker movement, which generally is based on the idea of hacking things, as a good way for us to think of the life of things, since they seem to pay attention to final form of pre-designed objects as a means to discover new potentials, new potentials for the materials. That's the question. 
I'm really not sure. I've I've only come up uh, come across this whole maker movement and and a little bit and 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 as you say in the question, um, it seems to be a derivative of of hacking. Um, so so it's it's something that that's come out of a particular context, which is which is the digital world in many ways alien to the world of 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 craft. For example, um, it it and it seems to be um, it seems to be something akin to bricolage, um, to to a process of 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 reassembling things out of the bits and pieces of of other things, um, and there is. Just one thing I would say about that, that, and it goes back to, actually, to Henri Bergson. Uh, Bob Bergson it said that that he he distinguished between um, fabrication and invention. I think those are the words he used. And and with fabrication, you simply recombine bits and pieces of things that were already there. Um, it's like if you had a kaleidoscope full of beads and you shake it, and every time you shake it, you get a new pattern, but absolutely nothing new comes into being through that. So you have a lot of novelty, but nothing new. Uh, and I think that maybe the maker movement is to some extent engaged in fabrication. Invention for Bergson meant the creation of the absolutely new. It meant the birth of something that was not there before. And, and, and that is where the creative element lies, not in reassembling bits and pieces of old things, but actually in giving birth to something new. Um, there's this fascinating account by George Kubler, an art historian based from the 1960s in a book called the shape of things, I think it was called, where he talks about prime numbers and the difference between prime numbers and other kinds of numbers. And, and the thing is that all, all, all non-prime numbers can be derived as der derivatives and combinations of existing ones, but prime numbers cannot. And, 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 and there's something about the prime number as, as the generation of something absolutely new, which is not simply the recombination of existing elements, um, and 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 that I think is the important element to to grasp. Thank you so much. Now um, we will go to our last question of the this afternoon of this conversation. Um, it comes from Maria Cristina Ibarra from the Federal University of Pernambuco, UFPE, in Recife, Brazil. But there's, she's tricky because it's one question that turns into three, actually. So, number one, there are thinkers who question the concept of object, but you also question the concept of subject. That's correct. Could you please tell us more about it? Two, what do you think about methods? Do you, do you question the traditional concept of them? Why? And three, what is the question that no one asks you? I, I'm just writing these questions down. And then I'll answer them. And hello, hello, Christina. <laughs> nice to see you. A uh, uh, question that no one answers. First one. Um, yes. Um, I, I, for the same reason that I question the concept of object, I question the concept of subject. I, I think the, the one does imply the other. And if you're going to get rid of objects, then we have to get rid of subjects too. And, and um, that is, it, it's the subject object dichotomy that is the source of the problem. And you can't have one side of it without 
the other. And what I want to do is to replace that with an emphasis on the verb. So we might have you know, in, in the standard grammatical form of an Indo-European language, subject, verb, object, with the subject on one side of the verb and the object on the other, and the verb simply as a kind of connection between the two. Uh, I want to turn it around so that actually it's the verb that matters and the subject and the object are sort of swallowed up inside the verb. And the verb is the actual movement, the becoming of things. So, uh, so what we're calling the subject is, is actually um, a, a going on of some kind, um, out of which maybe a sense arises of, oh, this is me, or who am I? But it's an emergent, a continually emergent thing. It's not something that is, that is given a priori. And for the same reason, I'm not happy about the idea of intersubjectivity. It's, it's funny how many people who, who argue against the idea of ob objects and objectivity are nevertheless quite happy to talk about intersubjectivity. But if, you, if you're not going to have objects and objectivity, you can't have intersubjectivity either, uh, which is why I want to talk about correspondence instead um, of two things, right, like two people at a minimum, going along together rather than two subjects having this back and forth uh, relationship. So that's objects and subjects. What do I think about methods? Um, it, what, I, what, I, what, I, um, what I would like to get rid of is the idea of methodology, because I think that methodology is like a kind of immunization device that it mean, ensures that the researcher has no contact whatever with whatever it is that they're studying. And, but, but method, is all right. Um, literally, uh, it comes from uh, meta in the Greek, from meta, which means sort of beyond, and hodos, which means way. So a method is a way beyond. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way of doing things that can perhaps take you forward. But then it occurred to me that, um, that if that's what it is, then not only do we have our methods, but so do the things or people that we study. Uh, so I imagined uh, uh, sh uh, a detective like, like Sherlock Holmes uh, would say, I have my methods, but so does Moriarty, the arch criminal. He has his methods too. And what's actually happening is that there's a continual, uh, a continual kind of um, dialogue between the methods of the detective and the methods of the criminal that are carrying on together and responding to one another. Or you could perfectly well say that actually a cat, and I saw a cat in, in your pic, in, in, just a uh, parlor, uh, you had a cat wandering around. So, uh, so, so um, you know, the cat has its methods in the study of the mouse. Uh, we, we, in how am I going to catch this mouse? The mouse, has its methods in its studying, study of the cat. How am I going to get away from this cat? I mean, we, we all have our methods. And, 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 and in that sense, methods are simply the ways of the world. And, um, and these ways are continually responding to one another. And I, I think it might be quite nice if we, if we thought about methods in that sort of way, rather than in terms of, uh, of a process by which we, um, we do research on other things that are not supposed to have methods of their own. But if we all have methods, then the researcher has methods, but so does the researched. And, and what we're, what's really going on is a, is a dialogue of methods, which amounts to a conversation of some kind. That's what I think about that. Um, 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 what's the question that no one answers, no one asks? <laughs> what's the question that no one asks? Uh, if I knew the answer to that, I would already have been asked it. So, uh, so in a way, um, I can't deal with that one. Um, the question that that no one asks. I, I, I'm, I'm not kind of waiting every day, waking up each morning and saying, I wish somebody would ask me such and such, because. Um, I don't need somebody else to ask me. I can ask myself. But if I have, haven't asked myself a question yet, 
it's because the question hasn't yet occurred to me, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, so I don't, uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting thought. What's the question that no one asks? Um, hmm. um, it's probably the question, what is a question? Uh, and I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, so I better leave it at that. At that. Thank you so much. It's it's really great to um, to be able to have this conversation with you. It's uh, it's always an honor and kind of um, terrifying to suddenly have a two hour conversation with uh, your bibli bibliography. You know, you read so much and then you're like here talking. It's the great thing of internet. So um, thank you very much for being here this afternoon. I will uh, also thank the researchers at the Laboratory of Anthropology, uh, of Design Anthropology at SGUERG, LADA, NIDA, the Nucleus for, of Research in Innovation, Design and Anthropology at UFMA, Humusidades, uh, Independent Studies, and I will leave it to Zoe and Raquel to make the final thank yous and so on. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks everyone in the audience and thanks so much Tim for being here with us. So I'd like to, to say thank you again, Tim, for this moment. Um, your presence here is very important to our students to, to share this moment, to, to think together as we are doing this time. So just to say thank you so much and to say thank you for all those researchers who are here and at YouTube also. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I will ask if you if you want to say some some final words uh, after me, Tim. Uh, I would like also to add, to to thank you, and I, I was remembering that there are some some years from now that I'm inviting you, firstly to come to Rio, and then you said I don't want you to cross the Atlantic by plane, and then I moved to Lisbon, and then I invite you to come to Lisbon. And you said, I don't want you to cross the, <laughs> to cross the, the canal between the United Kingdom and Europe because I don't want you to take a plan. And then the, uh, this, this semester, I, I wrote to you saying, oh, Tim, now we can do it by, by internet because of the pandemic. So perhaps you will say yes. And you are like trying to, <laughs> to, 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 to find a, a way to answer me. And you say, OK. Okay, yes, let's do it. And so I'm so happy. And then I, I, I need to thank for this strange year and these strange contingencies that made it possible that today here we are together with you. And it's so important for our students to be in direct contact with you and exchange ideas about their researchers. Uh, so thank you so much for this amazing time. And I would like to ask everybody that were involved in the organization of this event, and also to Maria Cristina for this last comic question, because I was laughing a lot when you were trying to answer it. And so thank you so much. <laughs> and then uh, I will ask you to, to say some uh, words in, to end it. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you too very much, Zoe. I, I've enjoyed myself enormously, and I've enjoyed your, your company. Um, and, and, and all the questions have been challenging for me also and, and, and interesting. Um, I remember when, when Zoe and Raquel first came to, to Aberdeen and they were going to, to have a conversation. And in fact, it was impossible to have a conversation because I got some kind of uh, a flu and I completely lost my voice and was unable to say anything for a week uh, and, until I got my, my voice back. So then they had to come back again. <laughs> To have another conversation when I was better, so that that was a great advantage that we, we actually were able was able to set up a, a link so that they could 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 come um, more often and 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 certainly I mean they, that that this is a, a terrible situation that we're all in at the moment, but but the one good thing that has come out of it um, has been this realization that we can meet 
with people from all, all around the world, different continents, and have a and and have a very good discussion, including everybody. We don't have to worry about finding the money to uh, to travel um, and um, or, or 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 to stay in places. We we don't have to deal with all the inconvenience and the exhaustion of of travel. So um, now that um, we we are looking forward to. Uh, our country, the, the United Kingdom, being cast adrift um, from uh, the rest of the world by our mad political leaders. At least we know um, that we can meet again on on uh, on Zoom. So, uh, so that's one good thing that is uh, that that's come out of a of, of a rotten situation. And so, I, I wish everybody um, a very happy uh, Christmas and New Year, and uh, and let's hope for good tidings uh, in 2021. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Tim, for your time. So, thank you. Thank we you. We finish. Bye-bye.